Um, welcome to my talk about using mouse tracking to study Brazil search. And uh, since you yesterday already heard uh, a lot about Brazil search, I presume, in uh, Raoul Grieben's talk, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but instead today we are going to look at the movement side of Brazil search. Um, it's intuitively obvious why you would want uh, to look at that because normally in real life um, you do not only want to find a target but you also want to reach to a target and often that's actually happening at the same time you're looking for a target and you are already reaching for that and while traditionally um, it was thought that all these processes looking for something perception then um, the cognitive processing of um, those sensory inputs and the motor action are thought to happen sequentially and separated. Now there's plenty of evidence that actually all these processes, processes are happening in parallel and they are tightly interlinked. So we have neural evidence for that. Um, we know that there are neural correlates of decision making in the motor cortex. And we also know that uh, motor plans actually are feeding continuously into the motor cell system. So knowing that we can easily um, say that if we have uh, some process um, that we want to investigate, we can look at the movement at the trajectories and then try to infer what is happening there. So what does that actually mean and what does it look like and what does all of that have to do with DFT? So if we know that movement plans continuously evolve over time, um, this is actually something that was tested experimentally by Gies, where he um, presented participants with um, uh, different target distributions and queued uh, which target was the right one just after the movement was um, initiated and if the targets were um, close enough to another you would see that um, down here you see my brother, that you would uh, perform a default movement towards the average of the two targets instead of um, for example choosing one target or choosing the other and then moving um, later on when you have the queue which is the right target to this target. And DFT, for example, could explain this. Here you have um, a, a field, like you have probably seen them a lot of uh, in talks in the school. Um, so if you would have these two targets that are near um, to each other, or three in this case, then you would have a broad peak um, over all target locations, and then later on when the correct target is queued um, this would um, specify to one peak at the target location so we know that for um, uncertain targets you have these average trajectories um, average movements um, and uh, we have possible explanations for that with dynamic field theory This is, however, not everything um, that we want to study because it's not only about movement projects, but um, like I said before, we want to study visual search. Um, so what is the case when we don't know for certain where the target um, is in the scene? Um, and one example that studies something similar um, like this was done by Son and Nakayama. This is an odd one out task um, in which they had three possible target positions, like you see here, and participants had to reach to, um, well, the odd one out. And uh, depending on whether or not the target changed, so would, whether you would always have the green target, um, the, the target would all be, always be the green one, that would be the block condition, 
or whether you would have a mixed condition in one um, trial it's the green one and the next one is the red one and this is kind of randomized you would actually see these um, curved trajectories so you see here in the mixed condition you have movement trajectories that are also going um, that are curved towards towards the tra uh, trajectories and in the block condition that is not the case now what i would like to point out is that um, you only see these curves towards the middle like um, the variance is a bit higher maybe uh, for the target in the middle but you have no real curvature to the other destructors in the mix mixed condition uh, but there is a definite difference between the mixed and the block condition and what Song and Nakayama concluded was that um, it makes a difference in visual search whether you actually have to reach to a target or whether you just have to detect it. And this brings us to visual search. Because this odd one out task that they did in their study is actually one that does not require visual attention. Um, just a short recap for regards to over guided visual search as it was proposed by Wolf. Um, so Wolf thought that um, you would have a first stage in which the items, um, the features of the items are processed in parallel. And then in a later stage, um, you have to select, the, 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 well, you have an attention shift to the targets. Um, and whether or not this is happening depends on the search task. So in this first example, you have a pop-out task and um, there's no attention needed because the blue target will directly jump. Um, it's, it's so sal uh, salient that uh, it directly captures your attention. Um, if you have a single feature task um, like this or a conjunctive search um, task, especially, this is a bit more difficult and um, guided search would assume that you now have to uh, sequentially look at each target to find out, to, to bind the features of um, color and orientation in this case together to detect the target. Like if you had, had to look for um, the red vertical in this last scene, you have to um, check um, which target has both of these features. And this requires visual attention. So in the task that we saw in the last slide, this would not be a conjunctive visual search task. It's just odd one out and um, this would not require visual attention. Yet you see this uh, difference in the trajectories. So um, what about target items that um, have a, a similar feature as the target um, in a scene where you actually don't know where the targets are located in the scene? Do they also have an effect that they would bias the mouse trajectories like they did in target uncertain tasks. And that's actually what we want to investigate um, with two experiments. And um, I will explain these experiments now. So we conducted a visual uh, conjunctive search task. So that is a search task that would actually require visual attention directed towards the targets because you need to, um, well, you need to find the, the correct color and the correct orientation. And um, you see an exemplary display down here. We would first queue the target item, um, then the movement has to be initiated to, to give some kind of um, time pressure for the participants. Um, the scene is presented and participants have to click on the target. The scene is oriented um, with nine possible target um, positions. 
and then with um, these uh, 12 possible, um, uh, 24 possible distractor um, positions. So a distractor would be one search item that either has the same color or the same orientation as the target. In this scene here, for example, you have a, a item, a distractor item that has the same color as the target. This here is the target and here you have a distractor that's of the same color. And um, in another condition that we tested, there would be no item that has the same color, but there would be an item that has the same orientation as the target. And then we wanted to see whether this attractor that is actually not relevant for the task, but shares one feature with the target, would cause attraction of our mouse trajectories. And um, now I'm going to present your results, uh, the results of that. And spoiler, we found an effect. So we um, did some balancing where we uh, averaged the um, trajectories with the target to the left and to the right of the central seam and um, on the upper targets and the lower targets. So, and then we obtained average trajectories. And then we compared these average trajectories where the distractor was lying to the right and to the left of the screen. So you see here in red an average trajectory where the distractor was lying to the left and in blue you see an average trajectory where the distractor was lying to the right. If you look at um, it like this, you have here in red all the possible distractor positions where um, the distractor would be uh, considered aligned to the left of the direct path and in blue those are all distractor positions where the distractor is lying to the right of the path. And what we see then is that um, Overall, distractor, the mouse trajectories where the distractor is lying to the left have a bias to the left um, that is significant for um, about 70% uh, of the movement time. And um, if the distractor is lying to the right, you have a bias to the right. If we now um, separate the two conditions for color and orientation, then we see that this effect is there for the same color distractor. You have a bias to the left for distractors on the left, and you have a bias to the right for distractors on the right. But the same effect is not um, visible for distractors that same, uh, share the orientation of the target. So you see here the trajectories are more or less the same. This is also clear when you just compare um, average trajectories of uh, color and orientation. So um, you see here the orientation pretty much goes follows the direct path and um, you have a significant difference between color and orientation of the average trajectories. Now, um, what we want to see is um, whether this effect is due to um, different populations in the trajectories. That is, do we maybe have um, some trajectories that have a very high curvature? So that would indicate that participants first went to one item and then made redecision to go to another item? Or is this more a gradual thing? And this is why we uh, computed the local curvature of our trajectories and um, then had a look at the distribution of these curvature values to see whether there was a bimodal distribution. And if we would have find two peaks here, then we would conclude that we probably have two types of trajectories. And, um, this would then indicate that there's probably not so much of a continuous effect present in our trajectories. But as you can see, we just have this unimodal um, distribution of curvature values. So um, 
all the trajectories should belong to one population. What we also wanted to see was um, whether this was true for all possible distractor positions. Um, you, if you recall, we had nine um, target um, positions where the target put, um, could pop up, and then we had um, these 24 uh, distractor positions. And um, of course, well, it might make a difference if the distractor is placed very near to the target or if it's down here in the lower corner. So we calculated um, the um, effect size, cones D, for all these different distractor to target distances. And what we found is um, for all distances, we have an effect and it's above one. So um, we, that is actually quite high with regard to effect size. So this effect of um, the same colored um, uh, distractor on the mouse trajectories is stable uh, over the distance from target to distractor. So let's recap for a second. What we found is that same colored distractors um, have an attraction effect on mouse trajectories um, and the same effect is not there if uh, the distractor shared the orientation with the target. And um, it is there for all distances from the target to the distractor. Now, um, since color and orientation are both features that uh, should actually guide visual search according to some studies, um, we wanted to know why this is just color that has this effect and not orientation. Um, and we conducted a second experiment where we uh, changed our search items a little bit to try to boost this orientation effect. We made um, our items smaller, um, longer, and um, we used cardinal orientations, which are easier to perceive. Second, since we already know that um, the distance of destructor to target does not make a difference for the presence of the effect, we could also um, use less uh, possible distractor um, positions and uh, just throw some of them out. We also wanted to know um, whether there was a correlation between these effects in mouse tracking and eye movements and um, whether we could actually see these attention shifts to the distractor and eye movements. So in the second experiment, we also tracked eye movements. But apart from this um, differences, the experiment was pretty much the same as the first one. Why would we do, would we do eye uh, tracking? Well, there are um, different types of attention shifts. And in an overt attention shift, you make uh, an eye movement to an item uh, to bring this item onto the fovea. Um, these saccades are always preceded by an attention shift. So you can actually be sure that if you made an eye movement, you also had an attention shift. Um, but more interesting uh, actually are the covered attention shifts um, where you will shift in the, the, your attention to um, another item, but the eye uh, does not move, so you do not have an um, saccade. And in this case, you can uh, perform visual search while focusing a single point on the screen. Um, of course, if you can't um, know whether an covered attentional shift is done from eye tracking, then you have to infer it uh, in another way. And one way would actually be then to investigate um, mouse trajectories or movement trajectories, because if you have a bias, like we saw, then that would indicate that you didn't cover the attentional shift. So let's look at the results of the second experiment. We again found um, an effect for color and not an effect for orientation. 
We also tested a third condition here um, where we had a uh, distractor item that just shared no uh, feature with the target um, and this would be like a base condition but we see there is also no bias so whether you have a filler item that has the same orientation as a target or a filler item that is just the same as the, the target makes no difference for the mass trajectories. In the color condition, we had the same effect as in the first experiment. We have this bias of the mass trajectories towards the target. We also did the same test as in the first experiment to um, look at the local curvature values. And uh, again, we see that we have a unimodal distribution of curvature values and um, we also had a look at the velocity profiles and as you can see here they are approximately bell shaped for um, both the destructor to the left and to the right um, so we can again assume that our trajectories belong to the same population now to the looking data well um First off, we saw that the distractor was actually rarely fixated. This is true for all conditions. You see the, the start of um, was fixated a bit and um, the uh, target was also fixated in over 80%, but the distractor was fixated in 10%. So that's not very often. Um, in the color condition, we have slightly more fixations at the distractor in 20% of the time, um, but in the orientation and in the base condition, there were almost none fixations at all at the distractor. So eye movements were directed towards these points of interest, um, but they um, happened rarely at the side of the distractor. With regard to the timing, we can also see that um, participants would first look uh, to the start of um, the movement, then look towards the middle of the scene, and at the end of the movement, they would look towards the target. You see that here, color-coded with um, lighter blue and green fixations um, marking the time code. Now, um, since we can uh, separate our trajectories into uh, mouse trajectories where the destructor was fixated and in trajectories where the destructor was not fixated, we performed the same test um, for the left and right for um, the destructor looked at and not looked at. And what we observed was that um, we still have a difference between trajectories where the destructor was lying to the right um, and when the destructor was lying to the left in trajectories where the destructor was not fixated at all, at least in the color condition. In the orientation condition, not, but uh, I mean, that's obvious there was no effect, so it's not surprising that uh, looking at it wouldn't make a difference. We also see this effect in um, the case that the uh, distractor was actually looked at, which is interesting but not so surprising. Um, much more fascinating is that we would find this difference in the mouse trajectories when the distractor was not fixated. So we can infer that we have a covered attention shift here happening, that the distractor is attended to, but um, there is no saccade made to it. So let me conclude what we have observed. Um, we saw that same colored distractors attract mouse trajectories in conjunctive visual search. We know that conjunctive visual search is um, a search task where you would need visual attention. Um, but we also saw that um, distractors that have the same orientation did not have this effect. Um, even though orientation and color are both features that are assumed to guide visual attention. Why is that? 
Well, color has a very dominant role in visual search. There are many studies that um, observe that. Um, for example, in uh, one study, it found that orientation is only used as a guiding feature if color is not available. You also know that in uh, natural scenes, um, only color and um, sometimes shape would guide visual attention, but orientation is not one of them. So what we would assume is um, in the case where, uh, let me go back to this slide. Um, in the case where you have just one um, destructor of one color and uh, another destructor that has the same orientation but not the same color, uh, color is just so dominant that you don't um, that you directly find the target and don't have to shift. You, you don't use orientation to need to find that car, your, the target. Um, in the other case where you have a destructor item that shares the same orientation, uh, that same shares the same color as the target, um, you have to use orientation to find the exact target. So that's um, why you have actually have to shift attention towards the distractor. Oops. Um, we also learned from our eye tracking study that um, the attention shifts happening in conjunctive with search are not only indicated by eye movements that uh, there are also covered attention shifts that create these deviations in the movements. So overall, we can conclude that um, not task relevant items can attract mouse trajectories in visual search, but it heavily depends on um, the features and whether or not they, uh, the features of the items actually need to attract visual attention. And with that, I am done. And um, if you have questions, please ask. <laughs>